Good morning, everyone. Welcome to New York for our monthly uh, endovascular live case webcast at Mount Sinai, where uh, Dr. Krishnan and Dr. Kapoor with their team are going to bring in an interesting case for us this, uh, this month. Um, just a few bits uh, before we go on to the cath lab. Uh, the previous live cases have been archived into our website at peripheralinterventions.org, where you can go in and watch them, review them, and uh, send us any questions, and we'll be very happy to answer the questions. The next monthly live case webcast is on November 28th after the Thanksgiving. Um, and uh, without any delay, uh, we'll go to the cath lab. Dr. Krishnan, Dr. Kapoor, good morning. Good morning, Karthik, and uh, you know, good morning, Sandeep. Good morning. Uh, we're really happy and excited to, to come, for, come to you today. We've got an incredible live case that we want to talk, present to you and the entire audience. Uh, you know, first of all, uh, it's an interesting case because we've got our, our usual collaborative effort with our vascular surgery team here at Mount Sinai. And I, I, as we always talk online about how important it is in our field of uh, endovascular interventions to be collaborative, both with our interventional radiologists uh, and cardiology colleagues and vascular surgery colleagues. So let me introduce our team. Um, so uh, maybe you can pan. As you know, everybody knows Vishal Kapoor at the, at the end. As you know, he's the, the, the director of endovascular at uh, Mount Sinai uh, West, I believe, right? Oh, Mount Sinai St. Luke's, excuse me. And, and uh, right next to him, it's a pleasure to have Dr. Rami Tadros. Rami is an associate professor of surgery. He's also the program director of, uh, of vascular uh, uh, surgery here, here at Mount Sinai Health, the health System, or is Mount Sinai Hospital. And right next to him is our, our endovascular fellow, Asma Kalik. And Asma has been with us spending a year after doing a year of uh, interventional cardiology with Dr. Sharma. And right next to Asma is, is, is Dr. Lucy Price. And Lucy is a vascular surgery resident who, is, uh, who has already completed her general surgery. So she's a, the, the longer senior pathway of, of training. And it's a pleasure to have her here. As far as our team in the back, we have Ashley from Buffalo. And uh, she's our, 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 a, our, a wonderful <laughs> nurse who's joining us as Marichu is, is out. And we have Elizabeth Holton, who's our, our uh, lead endovascular nurse here at Sinai and without and Ray Lascano. And of course, we have Damien somewhere okay, floating so around, as you all know. You now, with that long way. introduction, I apologize for that because this is a very complicated case and a very interesting case that I want to present. And I'm going to have uh, Asma now go ahead and start the presentation because we're going to need probably the entire <coughs> hour or so to do this case. Go uh, ahead, Asma. PK, we lost five minutes uh, on your introduction. So. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead, Asma. Um, hi, good morning, everyone. <laughs> So today we have with us a 66-year-old gentleman who has a past medical history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, and prior history of cabbage, who also, who, um, also has a history of uh, known PAD with prior uh, low extremity cabbage and right femoral endarterectomy, and a, f a, a, um, a, a failed bypass to his right uh, lower extremity, actually. And he presented uh, a few months back with worsening <laughs> left greater than uh, right claudication. Basically, any he says he can hardly walk maybe two blocks at the most. Uh, his medications are um, lisinopril, you know, um, he's a diabetic, his diabetic meds and uh, aspirin and uh, pletol. Uh, his ra labs are unremarkable. Next. Um, so this is a, a picture of his uh, aorta, his abdominal aortogram. Uh, which we took, uh, and essentially you can uh, basically appreciate that there's a severe calcific disease of his left iliac and mild uh, ectasia of his distal, distal aorta. Next, this is a better look at his, uh, it's an iliac angiogram, basically showing again very severely calcified left iliac stenosis and uh, you know, basically uh, involving the ostium and the uh, distal aortic bifurcation. Next. So uh, at this point, we um, stopped uh, ahead. and we went ahead and got a CTA. Actually, let's stop there, Oscar. Yeah. Um, I want to introduce uh, Dr. Tadros, who I think you guys have seen before with us uh, in these live cases, along with Dr. Malik, Dr. Ferry, they've all been here. Uh, Rami, can you, can you tell us in terms of these distal aortic involvements? I mean, the, the, the reflex part of a cardiologist, uh, at least in the, in the community who does these kind of procedures, is to just go ahead and say, okay, I've got a focal stenosis. Let me go ahead and do a, a balloon angioplasty and stent. 
So if, if when you know this angiogram and you've seen it with us, um, yeah. obviously you know it very well. When when do you choose to get some imaging beyond an ultrasound uh, in terms of when you have uh, iliac disease? Is that a standard that you normally do a CAT scan for every person with iliac, yeah. or is it an algorithm that you generally use? Uh, if I suspect iliac or distal aortic involvement or aortic iliac disease in general, I always get a CT angiogram. I think it's it's helpful for a lot of things. It's in terms of planning, uh, if you have excessively calcified vessels that may lend itself better to covered stent grafts or maybe um, a aortic unibody graft, uh, it's, it's really important to identify the area of disease. It also helps me in terms of um, surgical planning. Say that an endovascular approach is, is not an option or unsuccessful, it allows us to then plan a surgical procedure mm -hmm. at the same time. So I, th I think s uh, for any patient that has suspected aortic iliac disease, so absent femoral pulses, that's CT for sure. angiogram. So 100%. okay, Karthik, is that what you use? Or Sandeep, well, what about you guys? I mean, in terms of what you do for the aortic iliac system when you guys do uh, uh, stenosis of the iliac, do, do you wait right. for the, um, say you have an ultrasound or an ABI PVR that's abnormal. This guy's a claudic and he basically came in with an ABI PVR that was abnormal. And then, and then went ahead and uh, we did an angiogram because he was a claudicant. And, and we found that he had aortic iliac disease. Do you, is there anything you use differently in, in your practices or would you recommend to our audience what, what you should do? So um, for me, PK, uh, in my practice commonly, if uh, I see ABI PVRs, if there are significantly dropped ABI PVRs in the thigh, Right. Um, then I go for CAT scan before the angiogram. Okay. I routinely do CAT scan for any patient before the angiogram because right. I can plan the angiogram instead of doing two invasive studies. I can do a non-invasive study, plan the right. aortic iliac okay. disease, right. and then decide if I really right. have to, what kind of intervention I can decide. Right. So I can go in with that information. Fantastic. That's my plan. What about, what about you, Sandeep? Uh, uh, what do you do? You know, if uh, I would agree with that thing, if the femoral pulses are weak and, uh, you know, there is a suggestion of inflow, distal aortic involvement, CT would be a modality to plan out and uh, then go from there on. Well, it's interesting, you know, because what, we, what we've always done is generally we don't do a CT um, unless, unless uh, we, we've got a, a aorta iliac uh, involvement. I think when we have aortic iliac involvement where, where the aorta is clearly diseased, and or an angiogram such as Asma showed you with heavily calcified disease, then I think we, we go ahead and do a, a aortic um, uh, a CT, a CAT scan. Because generally I, I feel that you know you expose them to more contrast, especially if you have isolated you know, <coughs> distal common iliac or body common iliac disease uh, without a hypogastric involvement or distal aortic involvement. To me, Rami, what I'm concerned about in those kind of cases is they're already going to get contrast. They're already going to get uh, you know an, a yeah. radiation exposure in our angiogram. So I think that you know generally speaking, if if you do see it. You stop, you say, hey, listen, I need to take a deep breath, plan this case like we did in this particular yeah. patient, and then, and then obviously get more information. And sometimes you don't know what to do with that information either and whether it's relevant. We'll talk about that in a second. Yeah. So, I mean, that's generally a process. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think for, for run-of-the-mill PAD infrainguinal, mm -hmm. I don't think there's a need for a CT angiogram for a lot of reasons. I mean, if you suspect tibial disease, uh, CT is not going to give you the resolution that you need to mm -hmm. really evaluate that fully. And we've been fooled many times thinking that there may be runoff when, in, in fact, on angiography, there is none. Right. Same thing with duplex. It's just not for tibial disease. It's not, not accurate. So anything infrainguinal, I think angiography is still the gold standard Fantastic. by long show. So, so the, 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 uh, but the question is, you, uh, we get a CT when we don't feel femoral pulses. Correct. So I think, I think if we have blunted waveforms at the level of the, uh, the, uh, uh, the high thigh, you don't know which part of the iliac is affected. So I think we can either safely do a radial uh, diagnostic with a four French catheter or even a, a groin without a sheath. We've done sheathless four French aortograms and then said, okay, fine, pull it, hold pressure here, needs further workup, and you're done with just maybe put 30 cc's of dye. So I think that, you know, sometimes you're, you're able to get away with it, but I think in this case, it's essential to have imaging. So the second thing part of this case that I want to talk about is, is let me tell you what we've done here. So, so what, we've, what we've been able to do is we <coughs> pre-closed the, the, uh, the left groin here. Um, as you saw, Asma's picture was heavily, heavily calcified. So, and then we've got two seven French sheets up into the aorta. And if you remember, there was a very significantly calcified left common iliac lesion that was involving the distal aortic bifurcation. 
So then we, we went ahead and we got the CT. So Asma, can you, can you go back to the presentation so Asma can go over the CT? Where's Damien? Right there. Can, can you have yeah. uh, Damien? So essentially uh, what the, uh, the CT game. showed, and I have a few recon images of that, is that it showed a short segment focal dissection of the inferior abdominal aorta that was extending Abdomen. into the yes. bilateral common iliacs. And there was associated thrombosis of the true lumens bilaterally with the contrast filling only the uh, false lumen and false lumens. Um, and uh, also, uh, to add to that, on our uh, we did runoffs while he was here. So he had a non-obstructive CFA disease and SFA disease and POP disease and single vessel bilateral runoff uh, uh, was noted. Okay, next. So I don't know how well these images translate, but this is, uh, 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 you know, these are the cross-sectional uh, images of his abdominal aorta. This is at the levels of the lowest renal. And, um, and then you can see the next image is at the level of the end of the neck. Uh, Rami, maybe maybe yeah. you can describe what you saw in the order a little bit better, because I think it's important that the audience yeah. understands the important findings yeah, we have here. More right. Also. Oh, you have more? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, go yeah. next, please. If you go next, yeah, yeah, you can. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. What yeah. we see in the inferior aorta is a aortic dissection. Uh, you can see multi-septated aortic dissection uh, with mural thrombus and uh, penetrating aortic ulceration throughout down to the level of the bifurc aortic bifurcation. So approximately from the renals down about 17 millimeters, there's no dissection. 17 millimeters uh, distal to the renals is when you start to see the aortic dissection. And so this is a, a isolated infrarenal aortic dissection. And approximately a centimeter above the iliac arterial bifurcation, uh, the aorta is free of dissection. So basically, you have a heavily atherosclerotic aorta with penetrating aor aortic ulceration and, and infrarenal aortic dissection, which is a relatively common problem. Um, in terms of decision making, what to do about it, that, that's a very challenging one that we're still kind mm -hmm. of exploring in terms of the natural history of this disease. Let's go to the next slide. Next. Oh, okay, we'll stop there. Yeah. So, so I, think, I think now we're going to do an IVIS. And value of IVIS now, Rami, what do you think? Well. Multifold. One, if we decide to use an aortic unibody graft, we want to make sure that we're in a true lumen uh, above and below the dissection. And it further will help us delineate the plaque characteristic. Uh, so you're worried about the IVIS in the aorta, or are you worried about the iliac? We're, we're in terms of what you're looking for in the IVIS, because I know we have the sheath. I want to show everybody. We have the sheath up in the distal aorta, and the IVIS is through the sheath, right? Yeah. So, so when you do this IVIS, are you going to pull the sheath back and image the iliac, or you're not going at this stage? I, I, would, I would assess both. You would assess both. Okay, so let's do the IVIS. Go live on the IVIS, guys. So you want it with chromo, right, Rami? Uh, without, actually. Without so. chromo, guys, please? Okay, good. Uh, so Rami, just a question. So, um, looking at the CAT scan, right, the dissections are not, uh, I mean, they're evident, but you think you, you will always have a risk of getting into a dissection plane from, from the iliacs, uh, even though the dissection planes, I mean, the false lumens are thrombos? So, you, you, you can. So, now here, we're, we're fortunate enough where the, there's a, there's a, there's a portion of aorta below the renals that's not dissected, that's right, and no. a portion of the distal aorta that's not dissected, but... Okay. In cases where the dissection extends more proximal, then you want to be 100% sure that you're in a true lumen uh, the entire way. Here, we're fortunate enough, based on this morphology, that um, as long as we're in a true lumen above and below, okay. we'll be fine. Right. Okay. So now we're doing the intravascular ultrasound here. You can see the aortic wall. We're still, let's see here. Right now we're in the suprarenal aorta. What was opening pressure? What was it? Okay. Your fluids, guys. That looks like your distal abdominal aorta, and that's where your superior so mesenteric Now we're off. starting to see that dissection. I right. see that calcium. I'm going to pull this other wire back just to eliminate the uh, artifact. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. But you can see now there's clear septum between the two lumens. That's right. Nothing there, there. Nothing there. Nope. Again, you're seeing some mural thrombus along the, the wall there. I 
again wide open here. So, so this is very interesting. A lot, lot, a lot of important points for the right audience. Th right there, there's a, you can see there's a very clear calcific septum. And this is the area that I think concerns us. We have this type of weird calcium that's eccentric, which I think is going to give you a high preponderance of rupture is going to be because of this eccentricity of calcium. Go next. Yeah, so now this is your osteo uh, left common iliac, right? Yes. Uh, yeah. Right, right now, there. Iliac, yeah. So you can see the level of dropout because of the <laughs> ivus, the calcium, and then you have a postenotic dilatation, or aneurysm, right. whatever you want to call it. And then you can see, again, further calcified plaque as Rami's pulling it all the way out. You can see, and then you see some mural and thrombus that's where your well. uh, internal, uh, internal iliac takes off, and uh, I think now you're in the external iliac. No, now no, you're back in the aorta. Oh. I'm, I'm going back up. Going back up. But you can see the level of calcium. It's unbelievable. This is probably the uh, this is the areas. This, yeah, wow, this is the iliac this is the stenosis iliac. here. Yeah, it's very tight. So, so this is great. So I think for the audience at home, I mean, right now you can see the level, how the, you, know, you corroborate with the CAT scan with the IVIS. One of the questions a lot of us feel is, well, why do you need an IVIS if you have a CAT scan? And Dr. Tadro so clearly elucidated that where for us to really make sure that we're interluminal with our wire is, is paramount. So, so, so now the decision making comes in, right? And I think, I think one of the questions that Rami and I, and all of us actually, were discussing earlier is, is you know, do you treat the aorta? Do you don't treat the aorta? You know, how, do you, how is your decision made on how you approach this? So one is natural history, right, Rami? Yep. So can we talk a little bit about the aorta and what you, what you think about the natural history of the aorta, right? Let's uh, talk a little bit about that and the two schools of thought. What happened right. to the, oh. So I think the vascular community, and, and the cardiovascular community in general is pretty divided on the subject Shock of uh, uh, infrarenal aortic dissection and penetrating aortic ulceration. Well, it's, it's um, an 018, right? 014. A couple, a couple important. Change for yeah, Sorry. A couple important points there. One. It's important to assess the chronicity of the, the pathology. So if, if a patient had a CAT scan or some type of imaging you know, a, a few years prior and you assess that, the, f that the, the finding is stable over several years, that, of course, has a favorable prognosis and a, and a favorable natural history. However, if a patient had a, a CT scan a year ago and now it's a new finding, in that cohort of patients, the natural history is very unpredictable. Sometimes you may end up with a, 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 in a situation where you have a penetrating aortic ulceration, you can end up with an aortic rupture from that ulceration. Uh, you know, you can potentially end up with, you know, embolic events and, and uh, other uh, consequences of having that. So first, you have to really assess the chronicity of it. Get a spartacore wire, guys. And then if it's, if it's acute, it, it tends to behave different than if it's chronic. So one is the chronicity, acute versus chronic. Excellent. Correct. So, 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 so in this case, we know this is not acute, right? So we know that this, uh, this is something that, actually, we don't know that. You're right. We don't know that. But generally speaking, I think, you know, looking at this, he's had no symptoms in yeah. his abdomen. Right. Uh, he's got this calcified iliac. He's sporticating. Right. You know, likely, if, uh, if you're Which a betting man or woman, you, this is sporticore. Because we need no one for for that yeah. device. So, so if you're a betting man or woman, you're going to say, okay, yeah. this is likely not. Want to make a big curve or something? Or no? You're right, right, yeah. Now, the other component is what, what PK just alluded to, which is symptoms. If a patient comes in with, with uh, abdominal pain that is not due to any other etiology, mm -hmm. then and we, right we, we diagnose the patient with a symptomatic dissection or penetrating ulcer or intramural hematoma, mm -hmm. that's a very different scenario than an asymptomatic patient. And again, the... the the community is pretty divided on whether to observe these or treat them preemptively when either the, the chronicity is unknown and the acuity is unknown. So, so I don't know whether you can put up that uh, slide with, uh, with, uh, with the diagnostic uh, iliac uh, uh, So, Karthik. Ram, Rami, just a question. So, um, let's say if this is an acute, as, assuming this is an acute dissection, right, or something which has happened within the last uh, two, two, three months or... Um, W w how would it change your decision uh, decision making capacity would you would you choose to treat the iota at this point of time that that would happen or would you still leave it because you know type b dissections are still considered to be two a indications for for any kind of aortic stenting right so it's still the yeah, indication i think I, I would split those up because type b aortic yeah. dissection is completely different right i mean it's a related pathology right but the behavior 
can vary depending on a number of morphologic features. Right. With infrarenal aortic dissection, uh, the natural history is, is still not 100% understood. Okay. That said, in, in my experience, if this patient's asymptomatic and this is an incidental finding, I would put the patient into a surveillance program. Mm -hmm. okay. That said, there are Makes people sense. in the country that would, would, would treat this preemptively. Right. Now, that's not my practice, uh, and I don't have great data to support either direction on that. You know, you know, Karthik, I think the, the interesting thing from uh, my perspective, and I think this is important because it, this is where the specialties can learn from one another so much, right? And I think in, this, in the field of aortic uh, pathology, I mean, uh, the, our vascular surgery colleagues have been dealing with that much longer than, than I think most of the interventional cardiologists have been dealing with it. So I think, you know, if, if you look at that, can you put up that angiogram on the side so everybody can look at it as we talk, uh, that diag that, uh, in her talk, the, uh, the diagnostic aortogram that we did? So when, 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 you, when you see something like this, you know, you, as a cardiologist, you automatically are going to say, okay, you know what, it's an iliac disease, there, there's, no, there's, no, there's nothing that I need to worry about, it's calcified, I'm going to balloon angioplasty instead. Uh, not that one, Karthik, the, uh, yeah, the, yeah. yeah. So, so, so but, but the issue here is, I think you need to understand that uh, what, what Dr. Tadros is talking about. Yeah. I mean, when you see some pathology like this, you can say to yourself, okay, I can put a covered stent and be done with it, but, the, but there are issues that you need to worry about. You know, if there's an aortic dissection uh, and or thrombus that's causing this, you might need to deal with to treating with the distal aorta as well as, well as, the, uh, as well as the iliac before we go forward. Mm -hmm. so, so I think that's perfect. So let's, let's just, before we go forward, let's just talk a little bit about this. So when, when you talk about this, so at this sta stage you have two options, Rami, from what, what we had discussed, and maybe there's more, maybe the audience has more. One is treat the aorta um, and the iliac at the same time, right? That's option one. Option two is treat the iliac, leave the aorta alone. I don't think there's any other option in this situation. So, so and then one additional mm -hmm. factor is that, that the, so we have that proximal common iliac stenosis. Mm -hmm. Beyond it, you have a small aneurysm, two centimeters with extensive uh, mural thrombus. So if we're going to treat either, either approach, whether the plan A or plan B, we need to account for that too. And so, you know, landing a stent in a diseased segment of a vessel is also not a good idea. So Sure. And I think that's where the IVIS or the uh, CT scan showed mm -hmm. you that you had that angiographically, that does not look like a two centimeter aneurysm. To me, you think about it as ectasia right. and, and you, you may say, hey, listen, I have a nice landing zone proximally. So I think it's important for us to, to do further imaging. But in this case, so when you, you know, to me as a cardiologist, let me say what I looked at it. Initially, we said to ourselves, hey, you know what? This is a, a high risk for rupture. This is what I looked at it. I said there's an eccentric calcium involving the distal aortic bifurcation. It's actually eccentric. So if you balloon this, I'm going to probably either rupture immediately because I'm not going to be able to obviously ex ex push out that calcific plaque, or I'm going to push it out so far that I'm going to rupture into the aorta and retrograde rupture into the aorta and, and cause a problem or dissect the aorta going up. That's the reason we were worried about it. But, but having the CAT scan, I tend to think at this stage, hey, this guy's a claudicant. We, we have aortic disease. You know, we are prepared here to do whatever we need to do, and I think that's part of the multidisciplinary thing. I'm kind of leaning towards, why don't we just do a therapy to fix that iliac uh, and just leave everything alone in the aorta and follow the guy in a surveillance program? I mean, it, so when you look at that iliac, does that, does that, do you have any morphological features or angiographic features that would say that's, that's predisposed to rupture? Because I know we don't have anything in the literature, but we know exc eccentricity of calcium is one of those things that you worry about, right? Yeah, no, no, no doubt. I mean, when you have very bulky uh, plaque like this, uh, it can actually pierce the vessel wall. So as you angioplasty it, uh, the, the, the force of the balloon is going to force that plaque through the vessel wall and you can end up with a perforation. We see that sometimes surgically when, when trying to handle these very diseased vessels. So uh, that's certainly a concern. And because it's so close to the bifurcation, it's sometimes, even with a covered stent, hard to get a seal right at the bifurcation. You have basically two circles in another circle uh, within the distal aorta. You're going to have guttering around the, the, those stents. So mm -hmm. with even with kissing stents, it's really hard to get a, a seal at that at that junction, which is which is why there's concern here. 
So would there be any 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 value to putting a covered stand in the distal aorta, sort of a trouser, and then put two put two kissing stents up? I know it's described as something else in the in the surgical literature, but uh, we call that a trouser SKS, sort of you right. know, putting the pant trousers on and then adding on the two legs. Yeah. Would that be an option in this case? Can you do that endovascularly? You know, I th I don't think that's any better than putting kissing iliac stents unless the distal aorta is diseased. So my my algorithm is if if you have a aortic stenosis, an infrarenal aortic stenosis that you need to treat, then I, I do like that technique where you basically, you, you know, put in an aortic stent graft first. Uh, for that, I, I typically will, will use either an atrium or a VBX and expand it. Atrium, you can generally go to 12 millimeters. The VBX has the advantage of being able to go to uh, 16 millimeters. And, and then within that, put I in kissing iliac stents. So I, I do like that technique when there when there is aortic involvement. Right. Uh, when there's isolated iliac involvement, generally I'll, I'll use the kissing iliac technique with covered stents. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think there's a huge advantage to preemptively putting an aortic stent when there's no pre-existing stenosis. So in this case, say we both we discussed this. I know what we're going to do. But I, wanna, I want you to give us a little bit of background on the type of a aortic stent crafts that you can use. Say you decide, okay, you know what, this guy is acute, we're gonna have to treat this aorta, or there's a morphological change in this dissection over the last two months that you've been surveying, and he's got iliac stenosis. Is there an advantage to one graft over the other? I mean, what are the choices in this type of non-aneurysmal aortic disease with common iliac disease? So I, I think the probably the best device for this indication when there is occlusive disease is, is going to be the Endologics AFX device. And the reason I say that is one side is going to be 7 French, so you're much smaller diameter on, on one side, so you don't need a 12 French or larger sheath on the contralateral uh, side. And it allows you to maintain the aortic bifurcation, especially in a patient like this who has known pr uh, infrainguinal disease. Mm -hmm. It's nice to have pr uh, the aortic bifurcation preserved so that you can still go up and over. Um, and the, the French size is, is relatively small uh, at 17 French. Uh, to be able to seal uh, this infrarenal aorta, um, most competing devices would require an 18 French ipsilateral sheath. So y you're slightly smaller, uh, but Probably 17 French versus 18 French is not not a big deal. Not a big deal. But when you have heavy calcium mm -hmm. like this, it, it may it may make a little bit of a difference. So so then the, the, so so I guess is there any uh, disadvantages? Because one of the things that we've used this obviously in live cases before, one of the things is whether you have enough uh, radial strength of the iliac, especially this kind of calcified uh, vessel. Right. I mean, I know you, you, you're, you're under the guise of um, uh, the fact that you have a covered stand, but we know this guy has a lot of lumbar and other feeding collaterals into the back into the aorta. So yeah. even if we did this endologic device, you would still, in the final angiogram, probably still have filling around the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the device up top, right? Because of all the feeding, uh, feeding vessels. Gen generally not. No? You know, the, no, I don't think so. The, well, a couple things. The fabric is sewn to the outside of yes. the stent, so it does billow, and mm -hmm. so it can have that appearance. But the as long as you're sealed up top and you're you're sealed below, mm -hmm. and th and the graft is in good position, especially in this case where the the total aortic diameter is relatively small, oh. you're going to fill that entire space. You know, in, in a if you had a larger aortic aneurysm with with minimal thrombus. I, th then I, I would agree with you. I think that that would be a case, a scenario where you could potentially still have bleeding through, you know, uh, lumbars or type, basically what we call a type two endo leak. Mm -hmm. But in this case, where the aortic diameter is small, I think you're going to fill that entire space. So then, uh, what about the radial strength in this type of calcified iliac? Because I know we, we've actually buffered it with a balloon expandable stent after we've done the uh, the, uh, the the endologic device because yeah. of collapse of the lumen. Yeah, I think you still have to uh, treat the calcific disease. So my practice has been uh, to use high pressure balloons. So uh, either, you know, a large diameter conquest balloon. Uh, I've also used uh, Dorado balloons. So using a higher pressure non-compliant balloon to, to aggressively angioplasty the vessel once the stent graft is in place. And it's important to recognize that you don't want to be aggressive with angioplasty before you have the protection of your stent graft. Um, when you have 
sharp calcium. The other concern, something you need to be prepared to handle, is that you can potentially perforate the fabric. Yes. Um, so that's another thing that you have to be aware of. So you can always supplement with a with an extension limb. Uh, you know, if there is, a, if you end up with a fabric tear, or you can use a balloon expandable covered stent. But in this case, where we where we potentially use 20 millimeter uh, limbs, probably an, a, an extension, an iliac extension, would be the uh, way, to go way to go. If you ended up with a fabric tear, you can also you can actually put a second AFX device within an existing AFX device. So that would be an, another potential solution if you ended up with a crotch tear or a fabric tear. So that, so that you have to also be aware of that potential complication. See, so I mean, I think there's a lot of thought process. So what we decided <laughs> to do here for the sake of time is we, we, we decided to say, let's do a two-pronged approach uh, for the audience. So we're going to go ahead and try to get away with just treating the iliac without dealing with the aorta. But we're prepared to deal with the aorta because we've got a, a, a pre-close in on the left groin. We've, got, we've already got CT images. We've got the, uh, uh, the endologics device ready to go. But what we decided to do is see whether we can get away with treating this in a more simpler manner. Because my, my perspective, at least as this, this patient's doctor, is that he came in with really significant claudication on his left side. And clearly, that's because of that horrible dissected and calcific iliac, because aorta, aorta is not obstructive at this stage. So what, what we're gonna, we decided to do is to do a shockwave uh, uh, lithoplasty. And I know, Rami, I've never done it in the iliacs. You've had some experience. But let me just describe to everybody what it is. It's basically an energy, it's a shockwave is an energy-based system that basically uses sonic so pressure, I believe I'm reading, guys, so forgive me, uh, to, to, uh, to basically, uh, whatever, crea to create a, uh, a field effect to disrupt both the intima and the medial calcium. There you go. So basically, it cracks the calcium into the eggshell. So it's like if you take a boiled egg and you put it on the ground and, and you, you hit it, you get all these little cracks in the eggshell. So it's going to weaken the calcified plaque and allow us to, to, to expand this particular uh, uh, stenosis without, uh, under lower pressures than we normally would and hopefully get a more even expansion. So basically it comes in six and seven, seven right? Uh, six and seven sizes and up to 60. And, and, uh, and we're going to go up and show you, the show you how, how the, the device is done. But I want to ask Dr. Tardos, because I know recently you did one in the iliac, yeah. right? Yeah. So, I mean, tell me your, 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 what, your, what your experience was and yeah. what you thought. So the, ca the case that uh, PK is referring to is a patient that had a 5.5 centimeter aneurysm along with severely calcific uh, disease involving the aortic bifurcation and bilateral common iliac uh, arteries, where even passing a 12 French dilator was, was difficult. And we placed bilateral seven millimeter shockwave balloons and uh, basically used lithotripsy to pre-dilate the aor aortic bifurcation uh, and, and iliacs. And uh, subsequently, we were able to pass the 17 French uh, sheath for the endologics device. And we ended up with a, with a good result. We treated the occlusive disease and we treated the aneurysm successfully. Which is amazing. So I think we're going to go up. So we've got the <coughs> device loaded up, and we'll describe the cycles um, uh, as we go in. So, so PK, we're PK, Rami, and Vishal. I mean, all all mm -hmm. all of us have used uh, shockwave uh, balloon, but I think we have. Vishal, do you have any experience in uh, iliac? So or? No, I have, I mean, we have okay, I haven't so. personally tried it in iliac. I've seen a couple of cases done at other places, and of course, Rami doing it. For from my perspective, we use it in the SFA, but not essentially in the iliacs. But right there. hopefully, I mean, yeah. like they say, the experience is good. So <laughs> let's see how it happens. So it's the same thing, but uh, okay. all three of you guys, what is, what, I mean, is that, does anybody have a concern for perf when we're doing this? No, not with oh, the shock wave. Okay. So, so I mean, not about yeah, it's the lower, you, so you're doing it at lower pressure. So you're starting okay. up at two atmospheres and you're watching the balloon for expansion. So unlike okay. your standard energy plus balloon where you go to eight atmospheres to start or 10 <laughs> atmospheres to start, here you're basically going I to a it. much, much lower uh, pressure. How about you? So, it just need five so, it's only uh, so Rami and Vishal, while PK Ready? is doing it, I uh, just want to ask you a question. I think some of them in the audience will probably Go have this fourth. question coming up. Yeah. Is uh, yeah, can we just oh. treat that osteo left common iliac and get away with it? I mean, if you have to put a stent, which which I am assuming we do. Well, that's <laughs> what we're trying to do here, uh, uh, Karthik. We're just trying to treat, treat this. So we're going to go up here to four atmospheres, mm. and, then, and then we're going to go ahead and go to six cycles. Four. So let's start with that. Let somebody press the button and hold it. So this mm. has, um, you just basically mm. press this back button here at four atmospheres, and we hold it. 
and then you're going to hear all these beeps and you hold it for 30 seconds, right? And then, and then at 30 seconds, it cycles off. And then, and then you can go up to 10 atmospheres if we need to. So I had 30 cycles, I'm sorry, 30 pulses. Yeah. So right now it's at 13, 14, 15, and you know, it's going to go up. So it's like watching paint dry. So this is when you talk about your kid's soccer game or your girlfriend's, <laughs> you know, uh, whatever the dinner date you had or whatever but, uh, it may be. We covered the ostium there, PK. I think we're going to go up one more. One more. I'm yeah. doing so one here. So that's 30 seconds. We're connected. So, so, so it looks like yep. they're more in the, uh, yeah. more, more below the level of the ostium, say. Ready? Ready? Okay, down. So we're going to do a quick injection here. Inject. I can't quite see there. So, so, so we're gonna, I'm going to just push this further up here yes. and do another one right there. So that might be your, that might be your that lesion, That might right? be the Titus lesion yeah. here. A little more. Uh, it's not going to go here. Rail me. Uh, yeah. There you go. Right there. Okay. That's, That's it. it. Let's go That's up there. That's your lesion. Yep. Go up there again. Four or four atmospheres. So, so we're, we're, so we're hopeful to try so to go PK ahead. So PK Sandeep has a point here. He's saying the maximum energy is in the right in the middle of the balloon, which it is, right? So, you, so now you can start seeing that waste right. where that heavy calcium is. So he, his thought process is, should we center the balloon? You know, we next, did now. Yeah, next one, I think we can right go there. maybe Ready? Yeah. Right. There. Okay, we're going to go up now. You're at four. So again, hopefully we'll see it expand. Certainly seems to be expanding. So, Vishal, you th let me ask you uh, while you're inflating. Uh, it's, uh, so, would you cover, would you put bilateral kissing um, iliac stents if you have to stent it, or would you just do an iliac uh, ipsilateral stenting, Vishal? Well, I would probably do start with ipsilateral stenting and see how the uh, right side looks. It didn't show much on the CT okay. scan, and of yeah. course, we didn't do the IVIS. I but I would probably concentrate on the left side and see how it responds. Yeah. Right. I would do the opposite. <laughs> you would, you, you would, you, you would do what? I, I would do what? Walk it back a little bit. I would do a kissing iliac. Okay. And the reason is, I would in this situation, I would right here, right here. I would choose to raise the bifurcation about a, maybe okay. a centimeter. Okay. So well, to me, to me, what I would do here, Karthik, yes. you know, to me is it's sort of like what I want to do in this situation Four. is to see how this responds. So right now, what I'm doing is I'm just inflating at four atmospheres here, right? Angiographically, I don't expect to see much of a difference, you know? So, so what I want to do now is change out for an 035 wire, and then like Rami said, I want to go ahead and balloon, because we have, we have a CAT scan dimension that tells us what size this iliac is. So we have an 035 wire on the other side, and God forbid we do perforate to bail out. We can put an aortic occlusion balloon and then work uh, work with the, uh, with, the, uh, with, the, with, the, with the device and then be able to fix it if we need to. But at this stage, I think what we we'll need to do... Yep, what did you say? Good. Yeah. Yep, so I think we can come down. Yes, down. Yep. So we're going to shape the balloon. This is a very important technique, as you can see here. And then, and then what we're going to do is we're, we're going to go ahead and go up on the, with the UF on this side. Do you have a UF loaded? And we're going to do an aerogram. Give us a UF, guys. PK, would you do one more inflation? Uh, you could. I mean, you can go up to, what, 180 yeah. cycles? Yeah. yeah. Right? So we'll do one more for you. Center it at the... Yeah. Right here. It's, it's, go, it's moving much smoother now, Karthik. Yeah. So it's definitely done a job it's here. Right there. That's so let's probably go up again. good, right? Right in the center. It's definitely done a job. So, you know, I mean, listen, this is off-label. This is never. Be, this is not recommended or studied uh, in, the, in the iliac. Uh, uh, with this particular uh, shockwave balloon, Four. so 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 we're just we're just doing this to try to eggshell crack this calcium to be able to facilitate uh, not having to put an aortic stent craft. Whether right. we know that's right or wrong, we really don't. We do know that this this claudication is being caused by this common iliac stenosis. And as Dr. Tadro so nicely said, the natural history of this aorta is we don't know. There's multiple schools of thought when it comes to this. So, PK, what would, uh, would you do uh, kissing or would you do ipsilateral iliac stenting? I would definitely do kissing. Okay. okay. The, 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 no? the concept behind that is be thinking probably there no? is a uh, distalitic disease. No. That's why you want to do, uh, create a new carina? Uh, you know what? I, I don't think you, you're going to get away without treating the dislay aorta with this. That's going to be the problem. I think you have to treat the dislay okay. aorta. You so know, your I sheet mean, went I through it. So I'm assuming well, the sheet went through it now that we shockwave. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Okay, good. So now we're going to inject through this. 
Let's do an aortogram, guys. We're gonna have the we have we obviously have a seven French sheet sheet through the other side. And just give me a DSA in a second. A DSA please. Come forward slightly, please. Okay. Great. Again, Elizabeth, uh, being the fantastic nurse she is, has been checking the ACT. We're good with the ACT. It's going to go up a little bit more with this. Okay, ready? Sorry. Mm -hmm. yeah, Definitely, it looks like we made a dent. Look at that. Uh, I mean, it looks to me, it looks better. Maybe I'm dreaming, but that's me. I think it looks better. I think we should balloon with a, with a, uh, a, a, a regular yeah, balloon. Is that just bowel gas? Yeah. Looks like bowel gas to me. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. yeah so you See how it just comes before right. we inject? Looks like bowel gas. Yeah. yeah. All right, guys. So let's, let's get an 035 wire up through, through the sheet. I'm just going to push the sheet up into the aorta over the balloon. Uh, I mean, I, uh, PK, I personally feel like we should probably uh, end, up with, end up stenting it. But uh, what do you think, Rami and Vishal? Okay. With what I'm sorry? Do you do up. you think uh, I feel like we should stent it? Stent the it with uh, 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 we, covered or end yeah, covered or? stent. You should you should create a covered. Yeah, I think I think kissing. We're do an IVIS. Yes. I think kissing iliac stent. We have the AFX device here, in case we end up with a problem. But I, I think we we start with VBX eight millimeter VBX. You know what I'm going to do, Rami? Let's do an IVIS. Yeah. And and let's let's look at that uh, distal uh, lesion with the iris. Why is this thing not coming off? Hold on, hold on. Flush the back end of it. Yeah. Is okay. it tangled or something? I, I have a question for the group. Um, yeah. Yes. Would anybody consider? So now that we have this shockwave lithotripsy balloon, if you had a good result with the angioplasty alone, would you not stent it? No. Uh, I I would okay. not stop Give without me a view stenting it. Uh, that's my personal opinion. What would you think, Vishal? <laughs> No, no, I would, no, I would no, stent it. So the and everything. I would stent it. I mean, I would you know, not. The result, the I would not, so not stent it. Spartacore. No, 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 that's contaminant. Like Spartacore. Spartacore. Right. Um, yeah, I don't think we're there yet. I, yeah. I bring it up just as a, a thought, yeah. but I don't but think we're there yet. I don't think we have evidence yet to prove that, you know, you know, doing a lithotripsy, angioplasty of heavy calcific iliac disease is, um, you know, is going to be better than, you know, placing a stent. We know in terms of patency that, you know, Common iliac stenting you know, has 70% plus patency at five years. So th you know, that's been proven and we know that. So I don't think there's any reason at this stage PK, to what, what do you go think? against that. I mean, I think at this stage, you know, th you know this is a philosophical argument. And uh, I know I, you're a no stent guy. I know I, that. No, 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 not in the iliac. Are you kidding? Um, to, me, to me, I believe this. I believe that, uh, that we use covered stents way too much. Um, and I think Asma has a nice little lecture on on iliac, uh, calcified iliac approach. So while we do the IVIS, I'm gonna have her do that. So my opinion is we use covered stents way too much in the iliacs. Second is, I think balloon angioplasty in today's day and age, is it should be left as a, as a, not as a primary therapy, but as a preparation therapy in most vascular beds. I mean, I'll go ahead and say that because I think balloon angioplasty in SFA and just leaving it alone is absolutely, in my opinion, malpractice. Um, you know, unless, unless there's uh, some sort of allergy or other things like that, then maybe you should think about doing some other therapy like a bypass or something like that for that patient. Uh, second, below the knee, balloon angioplasty actually is, you know, we have no randomized data, but we know the recoil is so high. We, ha we have so many things going on below the knee. That's the only area maybe it I fits. Know. But I mean, iliac and SFA, I think balloon angioplasty is not a primary therapy, and that's, that's the issue I have with balloon angioplasty. Yeah. Right. But I mean, th 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 I'm very opinionated <laughs> on that. But me, Asma, uh, why don't you go over the what, what you talked about? Show me below. Mm -hmm. Why don't you talk, go over the talk that you prepared for the for all of us? Um, yes, sure. Can we get the slides back on, please? <coughs> Record, please. I'm going to do it, and then we'll talk about it. Go ahead. Yeah. So, um, go go back one more slide. Rami, I'm just going to pull back. Yep. Okay. So um, I guess we talked a lot about this. Now, uh, ne next slide. That was our strategy. So. Um, we might change it as we go. Go ahead, next. Next. There it comes. Okay. So, um, so basically, according to the uh, task two yeah. guidelines, any type A, B, and C lesions should essentially be managed with the endovascular, endovascular techniques. And in experienced hands, they recommend that even the yeah. task D lesions uh, may be treated uh, endovascularly. Uh, so, as well as the same, same goes for the uh, Society of Vascular Surgery, their practice guidelines, they recommend that 
uh, they, uh, you know, that the stent, r stent grafting can be used in uh, instances of severe calcification if there's a uh, vessel at risk. So essentially, I would say that uh, in this day and age, for most of the types of lesions, uh, you know, endovascular first would be the way to go. If uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 that that would be my s that would be the take home from that next. Um, so this is just a slide which is demonstrating that how uh, there's a decline in the caseload of, um, um, it's, it's worldwide, it's a, it's a paper from Denmark. So essentially between 1995 and 2010, there's almost a two-third drop in the annual uh, uh, aortobifem aorto bypass cases uh, worldwide. Next. That and, and that's basically given way to all the endovascular therapy that we now use to treat the aortoiliac bifurcation disease. Uh, so these are the various options we have, the self-expanding nitinol stents and self-expanding covered Viband stents and balloon expanding bare metal stents and of the balloon expandable covered technology we have uh, ICAST, VBX and, um, and uh, B, uh, BE stent I think, we don't have that in US as far as I know and then there's a live stream that's the barge stent and then we have the aortic uh, stent grafts either modular or unibody grafts as as we have been discussing next. So uh, and just a little bit about where to use uh, self-expanding versus balloon expandable technology and you know the, the, the strengths and weaknesses of each is that you know balloon expandable gives you better radial strength uh, especially in a calcific lesion like this uh, you may uh, want to use that and also better you know better post dilatation in case of self expanding stents there's they're a little bit more accommodative of aneurysm ectasia and they however cannot be undersized because there's not much room to uh, expand them afterwards and and the balloon expandable stents you tend to be uh, you uh, we can usually uh, precisely place them so we tend to use them more so for that purpose in the uh, dysleotic bifurcations or the osteoiliacs uh, next so uh, this is the uh, Corbis trial, so basically which compared the covered versus uh, uh, bare uh, stents for, for use of aortic iliac disease. And according to this trial, if, if you look at the first, uh, first, first um, image, it's, it's basically the freedom from um, binary restenosis in class C and, I mean, in the class A and B lesions. So essentially in that, the, the, the they're, they're basically similar, very similar in, in freedom from TLR. But if you look at the class C and D lesions, which is the bottom uh, bottom picture, you see that there's definitely, um, you know, the, the covered technology does better as compared to the uh, non-covered technology. Uh, next. Uh, however, there's another contrasting, a little bit controversial paper which just came out in uh, Jack Interventions, is uh, uh, which showed exactly the opposite. It showed that the, uh, you know, that uh, in fact the uh, balloon expandable stents had uh, significantly higher uh, uh, high TLR as measured by ultrasound PVR velocities of greater than 3.4 so uh, versus uh, the self-expanding stent technology um, uh, and th this is kind of you know it's it's new and it's kind of uh, you know it's like uh, brain fodder we can talk about it and how this is going to impact our uh, practice in the future and this was the ice trial next um, now this is a little bit about what kinds of uh, uh, balloon expandable covered stents we have uh, available to us in our armamentarium. So we have the atrium, which is uh, Mackey's uh, stent, and then we have uh, Bard, that is the li Bard Lifestream, which is their, their covered balloon expandable stent. And then uh, last of all, we have the, uh, and at least in the US, that's the, we don't have the other one, the, uh, the Bentley, we don't have in US. But um, Gore Vibon VBX, that's kind of been the new game changer technology. It goes through smaller uh, sheet sizes and it can be post dilated uh, much more. So it's a basically a uh, PTFE covered, uh, PTFE stent uh, which is covered with heparin just like its older uh, uh, Vibon counterpart. And uh, that's just a reference of what lengths and diameters they have available. Uh, next. And uh, Essentially, this is a uh, it's a paper that uh, was uh, actually is, uh, from Link 2000, our conference here in uh, uh, this year. So, which essentially compares the uh, primary patencies of all these uh, technologies, and they do pretty well in the uh, autoiliac domain. And you know, freedom from TLR is upwards of 95 percent in all of these stents. Next, uh, and this is another uh, good trial that uh, we should know for. 
the purposes of uh, treating autoiliac uh, bifurcation essentially is that uh, it's, it's the, it's the uh, Bravisma trial, which is essentially a trial that uh, compared uh, t task A, B, C, and D uh, lesions essentially and uh, with endovascular treatment. Uh, with uh, and, and in this trial, they used both, uh, uh, you know, covered and covered and non-covered stents. Uh, go to the next slide, please. And as you can see, that the 24-month follow-up, most of these lesions they perform pretty equally uh, as comp uh, you know w w uh, using just endovascular technology and. Uh the freedom from um, uh, TLR, you can see that it's 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 pretty good and uh, it's non uh, statistically non significant from uh, between uh, the legion types. Uh, next, and then uh, this is there's quite a few papers out there about the uh, you know data regarding the kissing stent used in the autoiliac bifurcation. One of these ones uh, was pu published in um, a Journal of uh, Vascular Surgery is. It basically demonstrates uh, that the kissing stent technology it provides uh, satisfactory results uh, in distal autoiliac disease, and they uh, it, it, it was uh, you know uh, it go, go to the next slide please. Uh, so as compared to the other technology, it ac actually you know uh, they initially showed a little bit of divergence, but uh, you know over uh, 48 months the curve seemed to uh, uh, be comparable. But either way, is that you know proving again that endovascular technology is pretty good and uh, I, whether you use kissing stents, they use they put all the other uh, techniques in others, so it's it's pretty comparable. Next, next, um, and then uh, uh, definitely go over this. Yeah, go uh, go go to the next slide, please. I can just skip. This is basically another paper, basically demonstrating the same thing of uh, comparing, you know, uh, kissing uh, kissing stents versus. Uh, versus uh, th this one actually compares kissing stents versus the uh, with the conventional aortobifem bypass and we can see that uh, so the green ones is the is the bypass arm and the blue one is the kissing stent arm essentially very very um, uh, similar uh, freedom from TLR uh, primary and secondary patencies they're, they're pretty comparable in, in all these uh, in, in both subsets well you've got to offset the morbidity and, and mortality associated with aortobifem versus kissing stents and what's the clinical scenario in which you're doing it. Right. If it's right. a claudicant, you know, and you have a reasonable, you, you have a, you know, comparable TLR rates, although aortic bifem is, would you, I mean, it is the gold standard, Rami, isn't it, in, in terms of aortic disease? So it has the best patency, patency. Uh, looking at 90% mm -hmm. at 90% at 10 years. Mm -hmm. Well, I think iliac, you're looking at 90% at five years. Five years. years. So, so I think I think it's reasonable. But go ahead. Let's we'll yeah, talk about so that after you're done. Sure, sure. Go, uh, go to the next, please. Uh, so now that brings us to um, okay. the other uh, interesting topic uh, that I was going to touch upon is the use of uh, basically these uh, stent grafts in treating distal uh, aortic disease and aortoiliac occlusion. So, so it's very interesting because, as as compared to the uh, to the other uh, you know other technologies yeah. that we use, for example kissing stents or trouser stents <coughs> with top hat, uh, creating top hat, or just pushing the uh, bifurcation more cranially. This is unique in that, you know, it, 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 can, it, uh, it sort of, uh, it is able to recreate the natural carina and there's less low disturbances. Go to the next, please. Uh, and there's a couple of studies I was able to find. Actually, there was, there was more than that. That was able to demonstrate that, uh, that these uh, uh, autoiliac uh, uh, and the endologic stent grafts, uh, which is the unibody stent graft, it, it performs really well. This is uh, this one study. I think is this one from uh, from America, and this one's uh, from Europe. Uh, go to the next, please. So the both the studies they demonstrate that uh, you know patients had uh, acceptable TLRs and and did very well in with relatively low complication rate. Um, uh, go to the next, please. And and the the theory behind that is that they say that this is because of the anatomical fixation that the device uses rather than proximal fixation and it it, it basically uh, uh, it avoids the limb competition and it also eliminates you know gate cannulation and avoids uh, and it, it also provides the way for uh, uh, up and over techniques in the future like Dr. Uh, Tadros was saying especially in patients who are known to have uh, infrailiac disease it, it leaves that option open for them for us to be able to treat them and again, it also protects against the fatal uh, aortoiliac rupture, which uh, which is not uncommon uh, in heavily calcified lesions. Next, and that was my one slide on uh, shockwave lithotripsy, which uh, which PK already alluded to. Uh, that's it. I have.
So, so I think I think one of the things that we have talked about is okay. We talked about why we're treating this, but there's another important part is that we didn't we didn't talk about sorry, Rami. We What's didn't that? talk about the uh, the calcified <laughs> common femoral. <laughs> so you can see this gentleman has a heavily heavily calcified common femoral artery, which you can't see with the sheet. And I think a 17 French sheet would have exposed him to that as well. But let's run the IVUS here. Let's run the IVUS so we can show everybody, and then we'll talk about where we are with the with the graphs. Should I run the IVUS. The prior round, the last round. You didn't record it? Oh, yeah. So we're going to go to the last run here. There you go. Second run, yep. So this is our post-shockwave lithotripsy. And you can see here, or lithoplasty, or whatever it's called. And you can see here, here's the distal aorta, again, large, with a little bit of mural thrombus. You can see there. As you come down, you can see the napkin, uh, or the, the septum that Dr. Tadros was talking about. And then as you further come down, you can see that at the level of lithoplasty, which is what we're concerned here, you can see you have a much better lumen, and you can see you have cracking of the calcium right there that's new. And then you'll see an area where you really see the, the calcium has been uh, cracked really deeply. And you'll see like a, a spicule that's actually mobile showing the effect of the lithotripsy right there. Right there. Now this is, I mean, it's dramatic and you see it, but I think this is what's pretty much has happened throughout um, the, um, the, uh, the entire ve ve vessel there with the lithoplasty that we gave. So now we're going to go ahead and we were able to pass the, um, the, the, uh, the UBB extents in. And Dr. Adros, I mean, as far as placing it, how did you choose where you wanted to place these? So I want it to be above the bifurcation. Uh, the area of highest calcific burden and most severe stenosis is, is right at the ostium of the common iliac. So I want it to be above that. And in terms of the kissing iliac technique, you generally want to be above the plaque. What you can al often get at the, if you land low, you can end up with a shelf above the level of the stent. So in general, I go about a half centimeter to a centimeter above the bifurcation when I'm dealing with a lesion this close to the aortic bifurcation. Excellent. And then so the important thing to remember, as we talked about earlier, is that you can still go with the, uh, with the uh, endologics device if you need to. I mean, uh, you, if you need to place this in the future, you can go up and actually uh, and pull it down. Is that your experience as well? You can. What, I, what we've been talked about. I know it's more difficult, technically. Right. I probably, in, in this kind of scenario, uh, if, I've, if I've raised the bifurcation, I would probably choose a, a, a competitor, uh, competing graft. I would still use a bifurcated uh, inframenal stent graft, but I may use a Medtronic or a Gore. Gore. Uh, rather than a, or even the ovation, which is also an endologics device, uh, rather than, uh, ovation is actually a good option here because of the, the diameter of the device, 14 French versus uh, some of the competitors. But, so you have a couple different options in terms of bifurcated stent grafts that can still be used in this scenario. Fantastic. So let's go up. So we're, right. we're, our ACTs are on 250, Karthik and, and Sandeep. We're going to go up. We place the stents. We can even take a picture uh, to oh see we where did. the we bifurcation Oh, yeah. Is. Show the picture, guys. O off. Scene minus. So, no, there you go. So we took a picture so after, after the lithoplasty. Yeah, and we're using the end plate okay. of that vertebral body as a reference point here. So you can see we're right above the stenosis. And if you want to use the glow tape, even by glow tape parameters, we're perfect. <coughs> so we're going to go up. So All let's right. go up. So this uh, important thing to remember, the VBX, as uh, Dr. Tadros said right. earlier, going up together. Uh, 12. Is that, is that the VBX uh, is at nominal, which is what's nominal, my friend? 12. 12 at nominal, it's going to deploy at 8, but this can go all the way up to 11. Uh, so when it goes up to 11, we will, we will be able to, uh, what is it called, post-dilate it with a, with a bigger balloon out to 11. You can see at 8 atmospheres, that calcium gave way so nicely. And I think that's a very good example of this particular device, mm -hmm. uh, which, is, which is the... Which is the uh, uh, the uh, shockwave device, which has really cracked that calcium. I want you to look at how the balloon is expanded. You have two different areas of expansion, and now when the balloon comes down is when you want to see the pressure. Obviously, if you have a flat line pressure, we're all going to go into a little bit of panic, and we're going to do our thing, but the, but the idea here is that you, you want to pull one of the balloons back, which we're going to pull the, 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 right, uh, the left side of the balloon back, because that's where we're attached, and the there's the pressure is already there, and then we're going to take a picture. Go ahead, Flora. Okay. There you go. As it comes back, there's our, our already we have a good waveform. Okay. Excellent. Take a picture, guys, Cindy. Good. So 
So Rami, uh, the flow, um, the, as you said, there will be guttering around the, um, the aortic uh, bifurcation, That's the new carina which we created. Are you concerned about it with the calcium you have? Repeat the uh, question, I'm sorry? So I said, because you created a new carina, right? Yeah. Right. So there'll definitely be some guttering around the aortic, st aortic stent, right? Out. The place in the, in the aorta where the Let's stent is, the VBX is. So uh, we're, uh, we're sufficiently above the iliacs where right. you could potentially flare the, the, those proximal stents. Right. Um, this aorta is measuring around 23 millimeters right. approximately. So, so you can start off with maybe 10 or 11. Right. Get us two 11 balloon guys. And just flare them. So, so Karthik, I think, I think at this stage we know that distally it's very well opposed, right? Right. So what, uh, what we're going to do is you're going to take two 12 balloons. You want to get 11? Or like get two 10 to our 20s. Two 10 20s. We're going to just barely come out of them. Yeah. Two 10 20s if you can, my friend. So we're going to go up top and we're just going to flare the top by hanging some of the balloon into the aorta. And right. this way we'll be hopefully be able to, uh, uh, you know, better oppose. We're not going to be yeah. perfect, but better oppose this. Now, 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 Rami, we still haven't dealt with the distal iliac, right? So that's going to be our next step. Yeah. So that's going to be our next step. Yeah. We're going to have to talk a little so bit about that. So the, um, the common iliac on the left is aneurysmal to two centimeters with extensive thrombus. Right. And right now, you can't tell. You can kind of see the calcific shadow, actually, right. on this, this subtraction angiography here. But you can see that the iliac is at least twice the diameter of that stent in that area where the stent landed. Right. So currently, our stent is basically floating in an aneurysm distally. Yep, distally. So we're going to go up with two 10-millimeter balloons. Uh, this is for the distal aorta. And then distally, now remember the nice thing about the, this particular VBX stent is if you post-dilate, the shrink, uh, shrinkage of the stent is going to be a lot less. Uh, they have, I don't know off the top of my head, they have a, a actual, uh, what is it called, Sh a card within the box <laughs> that you can read and see how much it shrinks. So here, Dr. Tadros is going up into the aorta, as we talked about. I'm going to put another 10 here. And when you go up into these, with, the, with these balloons in the aorta, you want to go up very, very slowly, obviously. You want to go, because you do, you're dealing with a lot of mural thrombus in this particular area, and you're also dealing with, uh, with, some, with some dissections and some alterations. So here we're just going to try to oppose the the the, uh, the 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 stent as well as right. we can and flare, actually, for lack of a better word, the uh, the ostium of this particular uh, stent to be able to go ahead and uh, and get a nice result, as you said, Karthik, up top. Mm -hmm. So so Dr. Tato is just going up top here, right at that spot, and then we're just going to go up slowly. I think what four is nominal, or Michelle? Six. six is nominal. Okay, six is nominal. We're going to count it out together, guys, and then we'll go very, very slowly. Okay. Let him, let him tell you when. Go ahead. Together. So, you know, the, the technique of kissing is very important because I think, you know, you want both balloons to inflate together. You want them to inflate evenly. And, and you want to be able to just really sort of oppose very nicely, you know. So, which is kind of what we're doing. What, what are you at now? Three. Okay. What do you think? Go to six, Dr. Tadros. Yeah, we can go to six. Yeah, we're gonna go to six. We have plenty of room up there, as we. Yeah, know. the distal aorta is large. It's twenty. Twenty. At least twenty-three millimeters. That's good. So distally, you distally you're going to put one more VBX. Uh, yeah, I think on the left side, right. I'd like to go down to at least the hypogastric. Right. And basically, exclu completely exclude that small aneurysm. So at least that way, we're not landing in the middle of mural thrombus. Right. So what size do you want there, Rami? We're going to go with another 859 or? Yeah, I think we can, we can go to s safely to an 859. Yeah, get us another 859. Damien, it's in the back, 859 VBX. So by or doing you know, that. Can, let's see how much length. We probably use 39. We have 39. Yeah. 30, 39. We have 39. We have 39. That'll be fine. <laughs> so by doing that, Rami, you're just trying to um, take care of a uh, risk of thrombosis. That's what it is, right? Yeah, my concern is that. Land, you know, land. You could potentially end up with an iliac occlusion uh, if we disrupt that that thrombus within that small aneurysm. Right. So we're here now. I'd rather do this now than than at midnight. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's an actual great point. So we're going to walk this out now, Floro, and we're going to walk these out. So one of the things, uh, you know, as we walk these out, you want to make sure that the wire doesn't go into the heart be or the brain. So you got to be careful with your distal wires, even though they're their soft wires and amplats is uh, it can be a little harder. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead. Oh, somebody hit the light. Yep, we're going to go ahead and uh, take a picture. So why don't we take a picture through that left side?
Laura? Mm -hmm. Let's go DSA. Yeah. Let me see. So let's just, yeah, let's get let's the sheets see. closer. Let's get, if we have a dilator, it'd be better. I don't want to catch that. Yeah, I know. I, I would just take a picture. Actually, let's put actually let's put the VBX and then take a picture. We yeah. can take a picture from here. Let's <coughs> make sure we didn't do anything silly. Okay, we're just gonna take a quick picture. Are you here. Ready? Yeah. Yep. Just to make sure we don't have anything crazy going on in the aorta. And we definitely don't. So we're good. So now we're gonna take care of the distal aneurysm. Do we need to post dilate the right side too, Rami? Looks like we do. We are. We post dilate both. I'm talking about the distal. Distally. I think we're okay. Distally. I think it looks okay. Yeah. Let's yeah. see. So we are putting the dilator Y? To, to cross the stent, just so we don't disrupt the stent. But okay. we're not doing that at this stage. We decided to go with the VBX at this right. stage. Actually, you know what, PK, I think you're right. I think we should definitely just extend both. Both, get, right? Get beyond that. Right. Get us another 8039, guys. Okay. You have another 8039 VBX? Um, you think on the other side, uh, uh, Rami, PK, you think the other side is uh, aneurysmal? Yeah, it has yeah. a very similar um, pattern as, as the left side. Yeah. yeah, that's why we're doing it. And I think, you know, we're, we're, we have a little bit poorer imaging just because we have a shorter sheet on the other side. Yeah. Right. But, I, but I think we're going to be oh, okay. One, yeah, okay, let's uh, do a puff there. Take, it, take a picture. Okay. A little bit more. Picture. Yeah, it's perfect. All right, let's get that 39. So, you know, <laughs> it's important when you place these uh, covered stents that you want to have a good seal. So, you know, the, the seal part of it is important, and you need to visualize the hypogastric or the internal iliac, whatever you want to call it today. So yeah. the, the, the point here is that Dr. Tadros has gone to the contralateral 20 and 30 to be able for us to visualize it. And now we're going with this, uh, with this covered stent. And, and I think this covered stent is, is going is to work just fine. Gonna have, he's going to have a little bit of overlap, which is going to make him comfortable so there's no type 2 endoleak, for lack of a better word. Or is that a type 2 or a type 1 when it's within the stent? Oh, type 3. It's type a type three. 3. There it's we a go. Type three. So, 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 so it's a type, type 3 four. endoleak. Right, let's go ahead so and I think, I think that. that's important. So this way we'll, we'll, we'll go ahead and, uh, and, uh, and uh, place this okay. properly in this view. Ready? There you go. You got to come down a little bit. You got to come back. You can <laughs> see here. Yes. It's a nice picture. You, you need to come there. back a little bit. So, Rami, are you concerned about sacrificing the hypogastric? Yes. What, uh, what concerns you? Well, first of all, this guy came in with claudication. Yes. And you include the hypogastric, he's going to end, you basically came in to treat him for claudication, he's going to end up with buttock claudication. Which is bad. And it's a man, so he can end up with uh, erectile dysfunction, which no one ever likes. And, you know, and, and the claudication in the buttock is not trivial. Yeah. Uh, we, before having iliac branch devices for treating iliac aneurysms, uh, we would often sacrifice hypogastrics and, and claudication may be permanent uh, and it occurs in about 50% of individuals, so it's not trivial at all. Okay, let's go up. Uh, if uh, uh, Rami's good with this. It's, uh, take one last picture just to be 100%. I think that's good. I like it. Let's go up, guys. So, so Rami, uh, go ahead. Um, Sandeep has a question here. Okay. Yep. So when you sacrifice one hypogastric, but do you look at like, uh, you know, uh, when making that decision, do you look on the contralateral and flow from the IMA and sacral? Or, or was that already considered like, you know, you don't want to lose one uh, hypogastric also? Yeah, so a lot of the literature on hypogastric occlusion preemptively is based on aneurysms mm -hmm. and endovascular aneurysm repair specifically. In those patients, you're often losing the IMA uh, because you're basically putting an infrarenal stent graft. So you know, perhaps the incidence is slightly lower when, when the IMA is intact, but the collateral circulation to the pelvis <coughs> is largely through the, through the uh, IMA, the inferior mesenteric artery, and the profundofemoral artery. So this, this gentleman also has a little bit of co common femoral disease, so, you know, there are collateral pathways. When a patient has this, he also has mural thrombus, aortic dissection, so the, the integrity yeah. of the IMA is also in question. So I think that preserving the hypogastric even in this patient is critical. I think also another technique that you can use here is to, if you're really worried about it, you can wire protect the, uh, the hypogastric, sort of leave a wire in so you know exactly where you're landing the stent. Yeah. So, Go so you're not no, gonna do good. this. Let's flare <coughs> the distal. Go ahead. Yeah, you have that let's have that 10 balloon again. Give me the 10 balloon, guys. Yeah, go ahead and take that out. 
and Dr. Tavros, one more question. So uh, now we're going to go ahead and post dilate this, and we have another 80239? 80, oh, good. So we're going to go ahead and do the other side. Let's get a, <coughs> let's get a 10 balloon. Yeah, post dill. So, so again, I think, I think you know, the, uh, the, the teaching points in this case are many. I'm just going to start as with the, they do this, and I think it's important because we want to stay within time. We try to get this case done in an hour, and you can see how you can do it very cleanly in an hour if you, if you have the case planning. I think that's the most important thing. So as Dr. Tadros, you can keep, uh, you can show, you can talk to him. I'll just, you can follow him, or you can do both, whatever it is. So the, the point is, I think here, you know, it's important to really analyze, you know, what you're going to treat and why you're treating it. You know, the, in this case, the aortic disease was, was in this so patient, six. incidental, because you never suspected aortic disease when you went ahead mm -hmm. and, and did the diagnostic angiogram for claudication. However, the aortic disease Eight. is incredibly significant and Wait. can really influence how your outcomes are going to be if you miss what the aortic disease is, 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 is uh, providing as a, as a factor to the outcome for this patient. That's very, very important. So here you need now to have, first of all, BBX good discipline in doing imaging when appropriate. So here there was aortic disease with, yeah, with high risk features of rupture when it came to uh, the calcification. You had eccentric calcification, okay. and, uh, which, which was in the, in the uh, distal common iliac, and you had a ragged, ragged looking right. aorta. So already you know your out. alarm bells have to go up. So when we did the imaging, actual imaging uh, with, with, with CAT scan, we saw that he had very minimal aortic okay. dilatation, but he had ulcerations, a little bit of stenosis, and, uh, and uh, also obviously a, a chronic distal aortic dissection. This is where a multidisciplinary approach with teamwork with your, with your colleagues come in, whether it's a, a surgeon or a radiologist, it doesn't really matter. But you need to get another set of eyes on this particular kind of patient where you want to look at it and then make a decision as to what's the best outcome. So here, obviously, we had the expertise of Dr. Tadros, who's done uh, you know, tons of these procedures to be able to help us. And what we decided to do was to do additional imaging in the cath lab with intravascular ultrasound, which confirmed not only our wire placement, but also c confirmed our, 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 our feeling that we may be able to get away with this without having to treat the distal aorta. Now, if you, d if you went with a traditional balloon angioplasty and, st and covered stenting, you may have gotten away with it. But here we had the technology with shockwave. We've had Dr. Tadros who've used this in his experience. And we went ahead and did a shockwave angioplasty and we were able to expand this really under nominal pressures with an eight millimeter balloon, eight millimeter covered stent. So now we're going to go ahead. We're covering the distal aneurysm as, as we talked about That's earlier that the shoot. distal, if you land the stent, within a diseased portion and a thrombotic portion, likelihood of distant thrombosing, yeah, yeah. especially with the covered stand, is high. So we're going to go ahead and, and cover the distal lesion, okay, with this covered stand, and that probably is a pseudo lesion because of the wire. Yeah. Uh, we're we're going to go ahead and, uh, and uh, go ahead and cover this distal lesion, and then we're going to go ahead and, and do a final IVUS and see how this yeah, gentleman so does. So at, at this stage, we are, where are we? We're all the way distal, huh? Let's get a better view. But is that a pseudo lesion? You want to pull the wire back a little bit and see? Uh, we will. I think let's, let's get this, let's get this uh, treated and then. It definitely looks like wire bias. <laughs> All right. Get, sorry. So Rami, here we are trying to just get, uh, you're just trying to get more opposition. Is that it? I'm, I'm, I was trying to extend it down to the hypogastric. Right. Go ahead and let's shoot there. The problem is our stent size, we don't have a lot of large. We have 17s though. We have an 8017 or no? They don't make 80s and 17s. The um, we don't, we don't have eight oh seventeen, right? They make it twenty nine, I believe. Twenty nine, yeah. We don't have. We can probably we can get a twenty nine if you like. No, I think we're okay. I mean, it's okay. So, but does that look like a pseudo lesion? I don't know. I'm a little concerned. I think we'll reassess once the uh, wire comes back. But I mean, can we do a subtraction just to be hundred percent. I think the worry here is if that's a pseudo lesion. Okay, ready? Uh, if that's not a pseudo lesion, then you're gonna have to put a. A balloon expandable stent there, or a I mean, a self-expanding yeah. stent. I probably just still put it, uh, preserve the hypogastric. You still would. Yeah. Or maybe do a bare metal across it. That's what I meant. So, Rami, a question. Would you, would you prefer to preserve both okay, the hypogastric? I think that's a good position. Okay. Let's both go the hypogastric? See, just one hypogastric you think will give significant, if you occlude one and just preserve one, is that won't be enough? Is that the, is that? So, the even when you do unilateral, at least in EVAR, when you do unilateral, right. you can still yep. end up with claudication right. in the buttock. Okay. So we're going to have to clearly post-dilate this card thing, and you know this yes. is going to shrink. 
So I think you've got to be very careful here with the placement because sometimes when you balloon angioplasty, and we've done this, when you do an 8 and then you put an right. 11 balloon, and then, and then, and then all of a sudden you, have a, you again have a leak distally. So right. you really have to go up with, a, uh, with a, uh, uh, a bigger balloon and really oppose the distal edge. I generally balloon with, the, with the more of the balloon within the proximal edge to try to shrink the proximal rather than the distal, but it's hard to predict how it's going to retract the, the oh stent yeah. when you go up with a larger balloon. Okay, let's go ahead and deflate. Deflate. Now let's see if we need to post dilate this or not. So give us that 10 again. So Rami, when you're putting a stent graft in a stent graft, like you did just now, uh, yeah. would you do the overlap portion with a larger balloon? Or uh, it's not necessarily, not no. Not necessarily, okay. No, I don't think so. Let's walk it up. So now we're going to go ahead and do a 10 and a 10. We're going to do a 10 balloon. Again, as you can see, the whole time we're monitoring pressure. Elizabeth's been monitoring the ACT. We're keeping it around 240 at this stage. And, uh, you know, we're, we're just watching the waveforms on, uh, on our, uh, on our uh, well, monitor. So, PK, as a follow-up, how would you follow this patient up with CAT scans, serial CAT scans, no, yearly CAT no, scans? No, no, no. You know what? I think, again, I think at this stage, I think we get a, we get a baseline ultrasound of that aneurysm, <laughs> of that aorta, and, and we have a baseline CAT scan. I don't want to give this guy un undue radiation unless I have to <coughs> and expose him to contrast. So what I would do is I would stick him in our surveillance program at Sinai here that we have an excellent surveillance program. I will go ahead and do ultrasound serially of both the, uh, the distal aorta as well as the iliacs. Okay. Um, I think the, the, the reason I'm doing ultrasound rather than CAT scan is if I see any morphological changes by ultrasound, that's why I'm getting my baseline before he goes home, then I'll be okay. able to at least see and then maybe get a CAT scan if I need to down the road. But okay. I think, you know, now that Rami's involved, we're going to get him to uh, be part of the follow-up for this patient. And then, uh, you know, we'll, we're just going to see. You know, this guy is not out of the woods. He has vascular disease, Six. and he, he may develop. He probably Six is going to need at some point to get the common femoral endarterectomized on That's the left good. side. And, and he may need other things to, uh, to be done for him. So it's not just fix the iliacs and, and get away with it. We know we've got good patency rates with these coverage stents. And um, especially in this particular case, safety was, f was primary, <coughs> and we were able to achieve this uh, without having to do, uh, you know, a, a big, uh, you know, 17 front sheet and, uh, and uh, all that other picture. stuff with the stent graft. So let's go ahead now and uh, take a picture. You want to put a pigtail up and take a picture, or do you want to do it from below? Let's do one from below just to, mm -hmm. to check the I'm a little worried about that distal. There seems to be some eccentric calcium there. Hopefully just wire bias. Is that bowel gas distally? It looks like bowel gas. Yeah. We can get a different angle on it to be 100% sure. bowel gas. Okay. Yep, that looks good. And so we move that bowel gas out of the way, right? No, so I think what it is, it's filling around it because that vessel is large. So I think this is the problem when, when you try to, because uh, you, you, you still landed in the aneurysmal segment, right? Right. So I mean, he's a Claudigan, Rami. We can yeah. follow this. If we need yeah. to stent it later, we stent it later. Yeah. I think we'll at this stage. a UF catheter here and <coughs> take a picture? Yeah, we're going to go up now with yeah. the UF and do an so aerogram. I, I still, I still, I'm still not sure if we are, yeah. What, uh, up top or down no, below? No, no, down, down, down PK. No, down, I, I totally I, I, agree. Down I, I, I agree, agree with you. I still don't know if it's just a wire bias or is it just, ga is it just uh, procuring because of the wire or is it a uh, true, true lesion? No, I think I, I think it's a pseudo lesion. I think yeah, it's a pseudo lesion. It, it is, based, at least based on the CAT scan, we didn't find a lesion there, so. It should be interesting. So I think, I think now we're just going to go ahead and take a final picture and we're probably going to end up signing off if everything looks good. It's uh, 9.20, so about an hour for the case. We were able to accomplish it because Ashley delayed the entrance of the patient. But, but I, think, I think that what we'll be able to do now is, is go ahead and... You want to put the sheet back on this side? Uh, uh yeah, we're going to pull it back. Yeah. But I think, Karthik, after this, we'll sign off, and I think we'll, we'll yes. go ahead and finish up. Let's just do one last picture with the aerogram. And even if we have to go back and send mm -hmm. that distal uh, external iliac, we can do that offline. <coughs> So, so Rami, any final thoughts? Anything you would add to this in terms of uh, the discussion we've had for our co for our colleagues out in the community? No, I think we've highlighted 
uh, pretty much everything. Now, we certainly need to continue following this person, as you mentioned. He will enter a surveillance program and. Hold your hold your breath, my friend, Sydney. Ready? Deep breath in. Let it all the way out. Don't breathe. Looks pretty good. <coughs> yeah. Breathe normally. There is some calcific plaque, but I don't think it's obstructive or anything. So. Where is the plaque? On, on, on the right side, I'm saying, PK. It's, uh, there's uh, just some plaque, but I don't think it's a lesion. Where? On the Distal right common? On the right external iliac, distal, distal to the stent. Oh, yeah, yeah. You're looking distal. Yeah. Yeah, we can get a better view. I'm know. not concerned about that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, to me, I mean, you know. I mean, sure. I, I think, I, you know, if not, now you're, you, you know, you don't That's want to throw the baby out with the bathwater here. I mean, right. you don't, you don't, you don't want to go ahead and chase this and... Uh, and get you know get lose that external iliac, that internal iliac. See that's very minimal. Yes. Yeah. yeah so I'm not going to chase that. And, and the as far as the distal filling of the aneurysmal sac, that's fine. We're almost done. Rami, are you concerned about that filling of the distal sac? No, I think that I'll check now on the CT just to confirm the, the total diameter there. Uh, but no. But I mean, if if the you are concerned, you're not going to get away with it without sacrificing the hypogastric. That's correct. So in that scenario. Uh, I would plug the hypogastric mm -hmm. and then extend with a with another VBS. Right, but I think we could monitor that and see how he does. Yeah. Right, I agree. Bec because to me, I think at this stage he's claudicating. If it's if it's if this aneurysm stays stable, you know, then I think we could follow him in three months with an ultrasound. Yeah. I'll send him to your clinic and we take it from there. Yeah, and in this view, you can see that iliac's widely patent. There right. No There's certainly some calcium there, but and the distal aorta, there's a little bit of uh, filling around the iliac, but I'm not too concerned anywhere else. Fantastic. I think there's a little bit of mix of bowel gas there along with... Uh, so would you repeat a CAT scan before he leaves? Not if he's asymptomatic. Mm -hmm. You know, if he has a drop in hematocrit or, you know, has persistent abdominal pain. He may have some back discomfort or pain after these kind of procedures. But if it's something that's persistent or uh, coupled with a drop in hematocrit, I would certainly repeat a CAT scan. Okay. You can even do a non-contrast. Uh, to, to see if you have an extra... if there's extravasation and mm -hmm. then... Or at least if there's hematoma, and then if there is hematoma, then you can do a contrast study uh, while the patient's on, on the table. All right. I think with that, we're going to sign off. I want to thank right. Dr. Tadros on behalf of all of us, really, for taking his time and, and his fellow as well. Lucy, thank you very much. And, and, and uh, you know, I think we had the, this is a fantastic case with a lot of learning and teaching points. Karthik, I think you should sign off, and uh, yep. we'll see everybody uh, next month. I think month. a great job, PK, Rami, Vishal, um, and all thank the team. You. Um, you thank you so much, that. guys, for watching. Me and Sandeep here uh, request you to come back again on November 28th. We'll see you again for the next live case webcast. Uh, this case will be archived into peripheralinterventions.org uh, by the end of the week, uh, as my AV team says. And then uh, please do ask any questions you have. and. Uh, our team and Dr. Todd Rose will be available to answer your questions if you have anything regarding this complex case. Uh, thank you so much again, and uh, we'll see you guys next time.